violent man. I hurt people. I killed people. A young woman and her child were taken. I want her back. Gather your team. Our next blacklister knows where to find Elizabeth. Elizabeth, I will come for you. Reddington is a spiteful, evil man. A five-way split. We're looking for a name. It's not for you to leave. Well, isn't this your lucky day? Mr. <laughs> James Spader, thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to have you here, sir. Thank you. Uh, congratulations uh, on the new season. Where are you guys in taping right now? How far into it are you? Oh, boy. Um, uh, we're just ending the sixth episode and just about to start the seventh. Now, when you first started the show, you're known to have a very active role. Uh, everybody talks to you about this. I'm curious how, if you knew you were going to have an active role when you started onto the show, or was it something about the show halfway through where you just realized you loved it so much that you wanted to sort of take on this executive producer role that you've taken on? Uh, no, the, um, the credit, the producer credit that I have on the show really is... Uh, <laughs> more sort of a retroactive credit, uh, just um, based on the contribution and participation right from the very beginning, uh, starting with the pilot. Um, it just was how we have always made the show. Are you the type of person who sort of can't help but contribute and participate in ways that a lot of actors don't normally do? I, I suppose um, I say what I think, <laughs> and uh, um, and I, I, I just, I, there's a, I have a very strong desire that, um, that, that whatever I work on be the best that it possibly can be. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't really work on anything that I work on, um, uh, unless I need to earn a living, uh, because I have a very vital life outside of my work, and um, which I'm perfectly happy to indulge in that life all the time, if I were able. Uh, but I have yet to come into great wealth. Um, so... I have always had to earn a living since I can remember. Um, and so I guess this is a, a sort of diplomatic way of saying that everything I work on, I'm ultimately doing for the money um, <laughs> because that's how I pay my bills. Uh, and I try and choose the best possible things that I can uh, to work on, but I guess I probably just got in the habit of working as hard as I possibly can and investing as much as I possibly can on whatever I am working on so that I don't, it sort of mitigates some of the shame of the fact that I'm actually doing it for the money. <laughs> um, I feel very privileged to have possibly just heard a, a major story of your life and the, the reasons for living. Yeah, I, I don't know about that. I just know that um, the things I, I, I've worked since I was very, very young, uh, not just as an actor, but, you know, I... You, you dropped out of high school to be an actor, right? Uh, I dropped out of high school to be, you know, a gangster or, <laughs> or like a private detective or... A pirate or something, um, One but of the many characters you've played. Uh, but those didn't things didn't pan out. So, um, but in any case, um, I did a lot of things, uh, lots of odd jobs and a lot of manual labor jobs and things. Um, it turns out that the acting seemed to have more of a future, for me at least. Um, so I continued with that. Uh, and I enjoy it. Uh, I love stories and always have. And I think that's probably what 
kept me going in terms of that is um, I love to read. I, I, I really love to read a great deal. And, um, and, I, and I like to write uh, just, you know, f for myself. Or, but, um, and I like to, you know, pretend and stuff. You know, you know when I was moved to New York and, and I was, you know, shoveling shit at the Claremont Writing Academy, which I did for a while, or working as a messenger, or, you know, uh, I swept floors at the Minskoff rehearsal studios, and a whole bunch of different things. But, um, you know, when I'd be doing that, you know, I'd be walking along the streets and, you know, pretending I was tailing somebody, or, you know. <laughs> um, you know, or just, you know, anyway. Fantasizing um, and pretending. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I think that's probably why it is that what kept me going in terms of, you know, it started out just, you know, playing in the, making believe in the backyard, you know. Um, and then it turned into a career. <laughs> <laughs> Unbeknownst to you at a certain point. At a certain point, I realized I was paying my bills with it. <laughs> When you started paying your bills with it, you know, you have a, an iconic screen presence, uh, I would say. Uh, whether you're playing a different character or you're playing a character that sort of people know you as, I think James Spader as a presence is very well known as, like a, as, as a few things. And was that something that you tapped into as an actor early on about your personality or you noticed other people tapping into? For instance, the, some of the great villains that you've played or sort of dark characters with intense interior monologues like in Sex, Lies, and Videotape? I, uh, I, 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 I've never been aware in any way, shape, or form of uh, other people's perceptions of really anything I've done. Uh, I don't know, I, t I tend to live in a bit of a vacuum in terms of that. I'm not, don't, uh, unless I'm in a forum like this, um, I don't have a great frame of reference for, like when people come up to, on the street or something like that, which, which happens, you know, uh, in cycles depending on, you know, what the last thing was that aired on television or was playing in the theaters, you know. Um, And whether anyone bothered to go see it, <laughs> but um, I've always sort of assumed that that person's the one person you know who saw it or something. You know, I mean, it just doesn't. I don't doesn't really register. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't live a a, a life of uh, going to a lot of events or going to a lot of places where I'd I'd be faced with. Uh, People's, except for here, it's doing something like this, um, and, and and there has never been any real design in terms of the things that I've taken or any plan or I, I've never I'm not a very good planner in in terms of career or business or um, it really has been uh, at the time when I've needed to work I just try and find the best possible thing or the thing that interests me the most. Um, and I suppose through the years, there, there may be a, a trajectory that I'm not fully aware of or, uh, or a sort of film or something that I haven't really been fully aware of at the time. Upon reflection in a, in a forum like this, then uh, one gets an inkling for things. But, uh, But no, there has never been a plan or a, it's just, you know, what sort of interests me. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or characters that I think might be sort of fun. Like, you know, I like, uh, you know, I, I, I like strange and eccentric things in life and, and I think that probably has been my taste in work as well. I like things that are odd and curious and what attracted you to Raymond Reddington from the start and what keeps you motivated and excited about this character as you move into season four? Uh, there was a bunch of things. 
Um, it was the best thing that I read at the time. Uh, it, it was going to film in New York City, and I was looking for something that was going to move me to New York City, back, back to the city. I, I have lived here for many years, and then I have put in uh, a certain sojourn in Los Angeles and was anxious to come back to New York again. I had come back, uh, you know, I've, I've always looked for work specifically in New York. The whole time I was living in Los Angeles, I was always looking for work in New York. <laughs> uh, and then um, in 2009, I ended up, uh, David Mamet had sent me a new play he'd written that was gonna be on Broadway called Race. And uh, so I came in and did a season of that, and that was sort of the last nail in the coffin of Los Angeles in my life. Uh, I just couldn't. Uh, I just couldn't. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so I was looking specifically for something that was going to be shooting in New York. And, and, and also, um, you know, I wanted something, you know, if you're going to commit to a television show, you know, it's a, it's a big commitment. You know, it's a, this was a broadcast network show, so it's 22 episodes as opposed to, you know, 12 or 13 on cable, um, which is a little more appetizing. Uh, but uh, this is a big meal. Um, and you're also signing for, I've always kidded myself uh, that when you're signing that contract for six years or something, that, that somehow if it's a terrible thing, you'll be able to get out of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I've, I haven't had to test that. Uh, but <laughs> um, in any case, you've, you, you know, you've, one must be, you know, you can take a film, anyone can withstand a couple of months, <laughs> you know, if it goes south. Uh, um, but a television show, oh my God, you know, if that isn't a good thing, you're in trouble, <laughs> especially if it, you know, is successful. Um, so, um, so I was looking for something that would sustain, you know, something that really can sustain. Uh, and I was very lucky in that a, a show I had done previously um, really did sustain. Uh, it was a very strange show in terms of tone. It was funny at the same time that it was often very serious. Uh, it sometimes was incredibly emotional, uh, and yet sometimes it was just really silly. And um, so it was, it was a constantly changing thing, and it was, uh, and it was a fun, very, you know, really, it, it was great fun to work on because of that. And, and so uh, it was a show called Boston Legal that I did. And uh, thank you. So I, I knew from working on that, and I'd done that for six or seven years, something like that, I can't, can't remember. But uh, so I knew from working on that that, oh my God, I better find something that at least has that sort of fluidity of <laughs> material. <laughs> Otherwise, it was really, I don't know what I, <laughs> I don't know what I do. So this came along and I read the pilot and it seemed, you know, <laughs> this character's, uh, very strange, uh, and he uh, is sometimes um, very startling, um, and uh, sometimes very scary, but also quite funny and you know irreverent. And uh, it seemed like such a strange show for broadcast network as well. Uh, I didn't. It sort of seemed like it wasn't in the right setting. And so that sort of intrigued me because I sort of always drawn to something that seems like um, out of place. Uh, and, and it also seemed like we wouldn't run out of stories, you know, like we wouldn't be have to repeat ourselves too much. You know, I mean, it really seemed like you could go in any direction. Uh, and there was a lot, you know, when I read the, I don't know if any of you have seen the pilot, but uh, it was a few years ago. And, um, but, at the end of the pilot, you'd, you'd spent the whole sort of pilot with this guy, and yet at the end of the pilot, you knew less than you did at the beginning. You know? And I sort of thought, 
okay, that's a good sign. Uh, so, what the hell? Uh, here we are, and uh, it's still going on. You describe the character as uh, you describe the character as scary as well as funny, which in many ways goes back to a question I, I don't think you like that I asked, but feels like Itch. the culmination of a James Spader character. Very uh, scary, very irreverent, but also very funny and charming at the same time. Yeah, no, I didn't mind the question. Uh, maybe, I didn't, <laughs> maybe I didn't understand it. Uh, you wouldn't uh, be the first to not understand a question of mine. It's yeah, okay. no, I, uh, uh, there are no bad questions. There's only terrible answers, but... Um, yeah, I guess it is. I, I mean, you know, I like dichotomy in, in the things that I do. Uh, I, I guess I like that. I, I, I'm not sure whether I really am capable of doing anything else. Um, <laughs> you know, so... It seems like it's kind of from the gut and instinctual on your part to a certain degree. It doesn't seem like you sort of bog yourself down in the analysis of, of your choices or why psychoanalytically you might be doing something or be that... Right, I mean, I, you know, there was... Um, I don't think I had any business going on the last year of the practice. I mean, I didn't... I, I was an aberration on that show, I think, and, and, and uh, certainly everybody at the network felt that way. <laughs> uh, Is that true? Yeah, when David Kelly, you know, wanted me to do the show, they're all, you know, why? Um, <laughs> but, you know, he said that to me. He said, I really... I really want to turn the show upside down, and um, I think you could do that. Um, you know, and I, I like that about, you know, I visited for a year on the, on the American office. Um, Which is a wonderful, a, a wonderful stint you did on that show. Uh, thank you. And, it, and that really worked out. I, um, I got offered two things at the same time, and one of them was to do a film with Steven Spielberg about Abraham Lincoln and the 13th Amendment, uh, the passage thereof. And I was offered that eight months before it was going to shoot and film. And uh, as is often the case with me, I was broke. Um, I had just finished doing race for a year on Broadway. <laughs> And I'd, I'd borrowed every penny against my house uh, to be able to be in New York for a year doing a Broadway show. Uh, it, it was well worth it. Um, but, and I've never really been nervous about being broke. Uh, but... Um, Anyway, so I was broke, you know, and, and I was offered this, <laughs> and I was offered this film of which no one was really getting paid, you know, much. Uh, it was going to be a losing proposition to the film. Um, and it was eight months in advance, and I was, oh my God, I, how do I, I don't know how I can say yes to this, because God forbid something comes along where I'll actually get paid a sizable amount of money. I don't want to call up Stephen, who I respected and admired a great deal, and was also friends with socially. I'd never worked together, but we were friends, and I was like, I quite often would call him up, you know, like a month out and say, ah, I got offered some piece of crap <laughs> that I'm going to take and pull out of your thing because they're paying me more. Uh, you know, I just thought, how do I do this? And so at the same time, like five minutes after I got offered that, the office asked me if I wanted to come and, and, and come on the show. And, and, and they said, uh, you know, for... for you know, anything that you want, you know, I mean, you could come just for, you know, a little story arc, you know, just come for whatever, six episodes or whatever it is. And so I said, how about I'll do the show if you give me the whole season, but allow me out just for this shoot on for Lincoln. So forget the six episodes. I want the 22, mm -hmm. except for the however many it was, to do Lincoln. And they said yes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that was great fun. You know, I'd gone over there to do... I'd done one episode just on a lark to have fun, you know. They'd asked me to come over and uh, to do a little guest thing for one episode. 
near the end of the season that was the end of Stephen Carell's time on the show. And they were such fun. They were really great, fun people. But anyway, I mean, this is such a long and circuitous route to get to the fact it's that... very entertaining. Oh, okay. But <laughs> anyway, uh, th was that uh, that role on The Office, which was great fun. I loved doing that. But those two roles, actually, in, in the movies, in, in the film, uh, Lincoln, and then also in The Office, it was a stellar year for me uh, because uh, I, I loved doing both things. But both things were these odd animals strangely out of place in both settings. You know, the character in The Office was, <laughs> he was a very sort of serious guy who I thought was hilarious, but, you know, I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, I was biased. But, you know, I thought he was such a strange, but he also, I, people would say, you know, that they were terrified by him. <laughs> and I thought he was very funny. Uh, but... Um, I guess he was funny and terrifying at the same time. I don't know. Which you're so good but, at. I got to tell you. Anyway, and then in Lincoln, you know, which was a very, very, very serious and lovely movie. If you haven't seen it, I love the movie, uh, regardless of whether I was in it or not. I, I really am, and I'm only in it for, I don't know, 15 minutes or something. But, uh, you know, uh, it was a lovely movie. But I was really lucky in that I ended up, like, being the one really funny character in this very serious movie. So... It worked out. I, you know, I like that. Uh. And I mean, if you're you're talking about from a practical standpoint and work and, and making money and doing good work, you must be feel so lucky right now that you're on the blacklist, which is one of the few sort of great successes of primetime television right now in an age where less people are watching TV in a linear way. They're still watching the blacklist. The show is extremely successful and it's very, very good which is also a rarity when it comes to, to all of television. So congratulations Thank on you. that. Thank you. Um, before I open it up to the audience, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you what we're in store for when it comes to the next season and let you tease a little bit. I know Alexander Kirk has sort of said that he is uh, Elizabeth's father and you're in search of her. Is there anything that you can... Oh, he's full say? of shit. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. No, it, uh, <laughs> no, um, I, I, you don't want me to tell you anything, do you? You don't really want me to tell you anything, do you? I mean, that would just, that'd be a terrible mistake, wouldn't it? Nobody ever wants that, but they always think that I would do a bad job if I didn't at least ask you to tell No, them. everyone asks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everyone asks. I, I just read something that I'm supposed to answer. Uh, I was given some questions for something. I don't know, I'm clueless when it comes to anything that having to do with computers or like uh, my, this iPhone, which I treat as a phone. Um, but but anyway, the... Um, this is my favorite interview ever. Uh, but the, um, there are some questions, I guess, from people that they're talking about that I have to do after this or something. Uh, and, and there's a question in there that, that truly I, we get asked all the time. It's sort of the format question is, you know, what can we expect from season four? <laughs> and which is always so funny to me, especially with our show. But I would think with any show, really, but particularly with our show... <laughs> Uh, hopefully the completely unexpected. Uh, so don't have any expectations. <laughs> and then whatever happens will be unexpected. Uh, let's open it up to the audience for some questions. You, sir. Yes. Um, if Raymond Reddington walked into a room and met Alan Shore from Boston Legal, would they like each other and what would they talk about? Um, well, I can guarantee you that Raymond Reddington would take his business card. Um, th th they, they might. I mean, I think Alan Shore would probably see Raymond Reddington coming from a mile away that, you know, not, this isn't someone to become to get too comfortable with. <laughs> uh, but
but I think they both have a probably have a they they do have certain things in common. They look somewhat alike. Uh, so they both would res respond to each other's narcissistic <laughs> tendencies. Uh, but I think also um, they both ha had a, a great lust for life, you know. Uh, I think they'd probably get along just fine, and I think they probably both would have an understanding for the right amount of distance to keep from one another. <laughs> um, next question. Hi, Mr. Spader, right here. Um, there's a lot I can say about your show, but to sum it up, I do love it so far. And I wanted to know, um, from the beginning of your acting career, kind of Ricky said it earlier, what have you perceived yourself playing versus the characters you do play? Like any idea of what you wanted to get into as far as acting? And what characters would you like to play that you haven't so far? Uh, you know, I, I always thought that I was a great character actor. Like when I was a kid, uh, generally, when I was doing theater in school and stuff, you know. In Wind in the Willows, I played Mr. Toad. Uh, and I'd always want to play like the old guy or the, you know, I'd always, that's what I was drawn to, you know. Um, and, but when I came, was coming up as a young actor, uh, there was this whole spate of sort of young, sort of, I don't know, coming of age, sort of, I don't know, there's a whole bunch of films that were being made at that time that were sort of young, youngsters, you know. Um, Tough turf. Uh, you know, there's like a list of young, sort of youth-oriented things. I guess there always is, isn't there? It wasn't just me. I guess there was also Andy Hardy uh, long before me, but um, uh, that reference didn't really land, did it? No, there was, there was... There's one person over here that, that got it. Yes, and, and the older guy right there. Uh, anyway, uh, let's say Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland reference. But anyway, um, that's how I saw myself was Mickey Rooney, really, or Judy Garland, depending on the day. But uh, anyway, so I was coming along, and it was like young protagonists, you know, or you know, come some guy coming of age or something like that. And you know, I came of age when I was like seven. Um, so I, I'd, so I wanted to play the character roles. Well, the, anyway, so I ended up playing, you know, sort of the bad kid, you know, or something like that a lot. Um, well, that makes sense, though. I mean, considering that you had, as you said, come of age at the age of seven or younger than everybody else, because you do come across as the person in the movies a lot of times who's just a little bit smarter and has an edge on everybody else. I mean, specifically with those coming of age movies, Pretty right. in Pink, Less Than Zero. Well, uh, I always thought those roles were fun. You know, bad guys are always the most fun roles to play. You know, they really are, they're fun, you know? And everyone on the set, you know, everyone likes the, the bad guy, you know, because the bad guy sort of, they're not around for sort of the transitions in films or, you know, sort of they sort of kick the film in the ass, <laughs> keep it moving, you know? And there's always something happening when they're around, you know, it's, they're not there for sort of the slower period, uh, slower stuff in the film. Um, so I always had a lot of fun, and, you know, on the set, when the bad guy's working, there's always, it's fun, you know? I always thought those roles were incredibly funny. Well, they aren't to the viewer always, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, at all. It's like terrible behavior, you know, and, and I just always thought it was just sort of, you know. Uh, but what the hell was the question? <laughs> I, 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 I think... Uh, I think it might have been the same question you asked earlier. I'll rephrase, I'll rephrase it. When Maybe I don't like that question. Yeah, once you... <laughs> 
once you played the the sort of bully in Pretty in Pink, did you find yourself typecast at all, or did you find yourself still ah, sort of okay. looking for something? No, some listen, roles? and listen, this is a very that's a great question. If that was what your question I think was. Uh, we collaborated. That, well, that was asking, a good collaboration. But I wanted to know it as well. That didn't really you sound like your question, but well. uh, but anyway, um, that's another one, uh, and it's a good one. The the typecasting. That's a great subject, you know, because it's the bane of every single person's existence, and yet it's the most logical, reasonable thing to do. I mean, if you're putting up millions of dollars to pay for something. Uh, and believe me, no one who works on the film is putting up a cent. Uh, you know, it's some other poor guy, you know, who's, or group of people who are putting up every penny of millions. And nowadays, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars for something. Um, you, and there are no guarantees. And, and the thing about the pop culture or entertainment of any sort, you know, it's the funniest industry. It's a bunch of control freaks trying to control something that is absolute chaos and uncontrollable. There is no control. There are no guarantees. You can take a box office smash actor or director or screenwriter or anything, and you can put out their next thing and it can tank completely. If an audience doesn't want to go see a movie, they're not going to go see it. They don't care who's in it. They don't care. All those things are all just trying to mitigate the disaster. Uh, the disaster is the norm. It's not the aberration. Uh, it's just not the exception. It is the rule. Um, and so, they, but they still want to try and mitigate the disaster in some way, and they want to try and at least hedge their bets. So, of course, in every category, you want to hire the person that you have something that you can look at that's tangible that shows that that person can deliver what you're asking of them. You're going to typecast everybody. It's a resume. It is a resume. You're, you're going to hire a director who's directed something just like that, like what you're making so that, or what you're paying for, so that you know that director can make that. You're going to hire the actor who you know can do that because you've just seen them do that. You're going to hire the writer, everybody, the cinematographer, everybody is going to be that. You know, the guy who, you know, does the sound effects, you know, the special sound recording, the, he's going to be the guy who just did the film that's just like the one you're about to make. Um, without question, I do the same thing. So would every one of you. It just, it it's only makes sense. And yet everybody who's applying for the job no, they want something that they've never done before. They want to do something that is brand new and that they take a flyer on me. I'm worth the 10 million, you know, really. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. I can do it, really, I can. So that's the battle, you know, and it's a formidable one, but it's a valiant one, you know, and, and one must be vigilant. So I, would, I did do that a lot. I would come out in something, I'd be a bad guy. The next thing I do, is look for some good guy. And, you know, if I, if I played an antagonist in a picture, I wanted to be the protagonist in the next picture, and, and vice versa. And, you know, I, and I didn't mind sometimes going a year or a year and a half without working. You know, I was living my life then, you know, and if I could afford it, I would do just that until I found something that, you know. Um, was that an answer to the question? That was great. <laughs> that, was, that was great. That's probably the best reasoning I've heard for typecasting ever. Uh, I have so many more questions about all the films that you've been in uh, that, that I love, but we only have time for one more question from the audience, and I want to turn it over to you right here. Hi, James. Uh, my question for you is if you could go a little bit in depth of the mindset Raymond will have this season after thinking he lost Lizzie early and then losing Dembe, and, and it seems like inner conflict is about to occur in this season as opposed to like the, the cabal or whatever else that might pop up in future seasons? Yeah, the, I mean that started I think near the end of last season uh, where he just doesn't, you know, when he thought that, that Elizabeth Keene had died and uh, I, I don't think he really had a sense of what he was, you know, what he was to do um, now. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and they devoted a whole episode to it, which I thought was pretty good. You know, I liked that, that they did that. Uh, episode 19 last year, that, that really was what that episode was devoted to, was like, what the hell do you do now? Um, and uh, this season, you're right. I, I think he's... I, I don't think he knows... He has a default setting. And the default setting is to put one foot in front of the other and, and keep moving forward. Um, and so he does that. And, and, and to, to complete a task, and a task at the very beginning of the season is laid out for him. Uh, it, it was laid out for him at the end of last season. He still has a task to complete. Um, once that task is completed, um, I think... Uh, there's some <laughs> probably a certain amount of soul searching to be done, but you know he's also got to stay alive, and uh, and he's got a lot of business to conduct, um, and I am always surprised at his ability and resilience uh, to find humor and and fun um, and something to be curious about even in the most dire of circumstances. And uh, this year, you're, you were right in your question. It's different. It's different this year. Uh, it isn't just danger. It's also, you know, just such an incredibly, incredible depth of betrayal and sort of... Uh, but I don't think there's ever been a time Probably, at least the guy I've started to, to get to know a little bit, uh, I, I don't think there's ever been a threshold that he hasn't been willing to cross um, no, without really any knowledge of what might be on the other side of it, um, with the idea that there's going to be another threshold. <laughs> you know, so no matter, no matter how terrible it may be, or wonderful it may be, there's going to be another threshold that he's going to then lead him to the next place. And it's just finding that doorway. And, and uh, he will. Mr. Smitter, when, uh, when is the season, season premiere of uh, The Blacklist this year? Uh, tonight. Tonight? Yeah, thurs, uh, t Thursdays at 10. Tonight at 10 o'clock, The Blacklist. Thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to talk to you, sir. An honor. Thank you.